talking emoji. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Okay, so the goal for today is to finish the proof of the massive vanishing conjecture for n equals four and, and p equals two. So we're left with proposition one. Um, before we, I even recall proposition one, I want to give some other statements, some, a proposition and a lemma that will be useful in the proof, but they are kind of independent uh, of massive vanishing. So I'll start with this. So proposition, I will call this the symmetric identity. So uh, we take, a f as always, we have our field of characteristic different from two. And then I consider six variables over this field, and I will call them by names that sound strange, but they will make sense uh, later. So I call them C, X1, X2, Y1, Y2, and U. So these are variables over F. So that we have this field L, so the field generated by these variables, C, X1, X2, Y1, Y2, and U. This is a purely transcendental extension of, of F, of degree, of transcendence degree six. Um, then I want to define some polynomials using, using these uh, variables. So D will be U squared minus C. W will be x1, y2, plus x2, y1. Okay, and then v, that's a little bit longer. v will be x1, y1, plus u, x1, y2, plus u, x2, y1, and then plus c, x2, y2. So these are all polynomials in, in, in L. Um, Notice the symmetry between the xi's and the yi's. So this is one reason why we call the variables this way. Uh, these polynomials are, will be symmetric if you switch xi and yi, yi. Okay, so then what is the conclusion then? Then in the Brouwer group of L, I guess in the two torsion of, this, of the Brouwer group, Oh, well, we have this identity, so the symmetric identity. I'm not sure if this is uh, readable in any case. x1 squared minus cx2 squared times y1 squared minus cy2 squared, uh, comma, 2wv. So this is the class of a quaternion algebra in the Brouwer group, right? So it's, a, it's a symbol. So it, it is equal to the sum of three Brouwer classes. So the first one is x1 squared minus cx2 squared, comma, 2x2, x1 plus ux2, plus the same thing with x replaced by y, so y1 squared minus c, y2 squared, 2y2, y1 plus u, y2. And then plus a mixed term, so d, um, x1 plus u, x2, and then y1 plus u, y2, v, okay? So this is a, a symmetric identity, symmetric in xi and yi, which is in the broader group of this uh, field L. And the part of the proof will be specializing this identity to smaller, to smaller fields. Uh, oh, sorry. But for now, I, I just want to sketch the proof of this. So there is, a, there is a general strategy to prove identities like this in the Brouwer group of uh, purely transcendental fields extensions. So we have a left-hand side and a right-hand side. We want to show they're equal. What we do is first we compute residues. I'll say what they are. We compute residues and we show they're equal. 
And then we specialize at some point, some f point. So we specialize the values of these variables for, for some numbers, and then we see that the classes are equal there. And this gives us, um, this is a method to prove identities in these, for these function fields. Um, so, okay, so. Right, so the, the reason that works is that because this is the Brouwer group of a rational, of, of A6, right? Of the function field of A6, if you show that the, class, that the classes have the same residues, then that means that the difference is a constant class. Oh. It's unramified, so it's a constant class. And then you specialize the point. It's, if it's zero at that point, then it has to be zero. Okay, so, uh, so just say here, my show, well, at least, the proof will be complete if we show that LHS and RHS, so left hand side and right hand side have same have same residues. And and, and equal specializations. Equal specialization at some point. Okay, so that's our strategy. Um, let's say at some f point of affine space. So this A6, which is spec of Cx1, x2, y1, y2, and u. And then it's a general result that if you have this, then as I explained, you, you get the equality. OK, so what, is, what, is, uh, this, uh, what does this word mean? I'll just give you the formula to compute it. Um, so what is the residue? So suppose you have some polynomial, P, irreducible. So P in C, X1, X2, Y1, Y2, U. This is some irreducible polynomial. What's the residue of some Brouwer class at P? Well, I tell you what, it, what the residue of some, um, of, of some quaternion class is. So suppose you have some some symbol fg, what is its residue? Well, it's given by a very simple formula. You take f to the, to the p-adic valuation of g. You, take g. you divide by g to the p-adic valuation of f. And now, now the numerator and denominator have the same p-adic valuation. They have the same, p has the same multiplicity. So this is a, this is a, fun, a rational function which is defined and non-zero at p, so we can take the class in, in the residue field of p, so in, in, this, in the fraction field of this, of this ring, modulo p. And in fact, this is, you need to take, this is only well-defined up to squares. Okay, so that's the residue. We have to show that all of these things are trivial, are one, yes? But this, isn't p equals two here? Okay. Okay, uh, so there's a mine. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So I guess it's still important, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Right? So in particular, in our case, each there will always be some valuation that is zero, so that would not matter. Thank you. Um, Okay, so now let, let's, let's do one computation, one sample computation. I take the first polynomial that appears here, this guy, uh, x1 squared minus c, x2 squared. Okay, so how to compute the residues there? x2, well, first let me write down some identity in L and then, which is immediate to verify and then, and then we use it to compute the residue. So if you take x2 v and you add up uh, x1 squared mi minus cx2 squared multiplied by y2, then you get um, w uh, x1 plus u x2 in L. So I guess this is proof. Uh, proof. Sorry? B? V is written here. Ah, maybe you cannot see. It's here. Okay, yeah. 
So okay, so you, for this you just plug in the definitions of V and W and everything cancels out. So then this tells us that X2V is equal to W X1 plus U X2 in, so this is in, the first equation is in L, and the second equation will be mod P, so in F of P, okay? Because it, mod P, this guy is zero, this term is zero. Great. Um, so, what, okay, let's compute the residues in view of this. So the residue at P of the left-hand side, what is this? Uh, it's here. So there is the, this polynomial appears with valuation one, and here, and zero here. So the formula just gives us two W, uh, v, two w v. And this is to be considered modulo squares. And the residue of the right hand side, okay, the residue is additive, or I guess, well, transforms addition into multiplication. Um, so, um, so here, this is trivial residue. This has, sorry, this, the second term has trivial residue. Third term also has trivial residue. The only, so this gives me one, one times one, and, and the first term here has non-trivial residue. It, it's exactly this, right? Because this problem has valuation one again. So this is two x two, x one, plus u x two. Okay, now you stare at this identity and you notice that this, so this again in FP star mod squares. And indeed these two things are equal. Just stare at this identity. If, I guess if you multiply by, if you multiply the identity by, by x2 times w and simplify the squares, you will get exactly this, that, that this is equal to this. Remember, this is up to squares. Okay. So the identity is used here. Okay, then um, you get the gist of it. You have, to, you have to do the same thing for every polynomial that appears in the, in the uh, so do the same for every polynomial that appears in the equation. So equation, you have to do this. And there will be similar identities and similar calculations. And then you also have to do this for every p not in the equation. But that is also, that, that is trivia because you just get one equals one all the time. All the valuations are zero, so nothing to say there. Okay, so this means that the left-hand side and right-hand side have the same residues. Uh, it remains to check that they have equal specialization at some point. I will just specialize. There's no, no need to specialize all the way to an F point. We just specialize to uh, C equals zero. And then if you want, you can further specialize to the F point. So what happens if I specialize to c equals zero? Then um, remember d, d is u squared minus c. So now, uh, c, so d uh, it becomes u squared, so it's a square. So let us look at that identity. The left-hand side becomes x1, x1 squared, y1 squared, right? I just plug in c equals zero wherever I, I see it. So x1 squared, y1 squared is equal to, well, comma something that I don't care about, is equal to x1 squared, comma something, y1 squared, comma something, and d, or I guess u squared, comma something. Okay, I've used this uh, identity. Okay, so now I have a square in the first term of every, of every, um, uh, quaternion, quaternion, so this means that the, the Brouwer classes are trivial. So this is zero equals zero plus zero plus zero. Okay, and if you further specialize to an F point, then it's again zero. It remains zero. Okay, so this, this completes the proof of this proposition. Okay, and now, now I want to say something about uh, Brouwer group under quadratic extensions. Okay. Um, I do want to save that one. Yeah. Well, okay, maybe I'll just, uh, okay, I do, okay, let's do it this way. I, I will just copy the polynomials here and then erase that board.
OK, so now suppose that A is a scalar in, in the field, non-zero. Then uh, a basic fact about, um, about quadratic extensions is the following. We, we have the following exact sequence. So fa star mod squares goes to f star mod squares, goes to the Brouwer group, two torsion, goes to the Brouwer group of, f of the extension, two torsion, and then uh, back to Brouwer group of uh, f2, of, uh, of um, two torsion of the Brouwer group of f. What are the maps? Here you have the norm map. Here you have cup product with A. Um, cup product with a class of A. So B will go to the quaternion algebra AB, class of quaternion algebra AB. Here you have just the restriction, right? A Brouwer class over F gives you a Brouwer class over FA, and here you have the co-restriction. Okay. So, the, so how, by the way, how to prove this? Um, I won't give the full proof, but for example, when A is not a square, you can consider this sequence. So this is a sequence of Galois modules. Gamma is the, is the Galois group of F. Chi A is the character. So this is the um, this is a, a co um, this is a set of two elements, right? It's the the, the, the quotient group, I guess, so C mod two. But the point is that this is a gamma equivariant sequence. So you can take Galois cohomology of this. You can take group cohomology of this, which gives you which gives you this sequence uh, as soon as you identify the cohomology of this guy, uh, of this uh, group, with, uh, with the cohomology of, of, of FA. So you need to know this fact. HI of F, F2 gamma mod kernel is uh, canonically isomorphic to the Galois cohomology of FA. And this is Fadev Shapiro's lemma. Fadev Shapiro. It's more general than this, but this is, it follows by Fadev Shapiro, which is a standard result in Galois cohomology. So in any case, this is, this is just to say that this is a very elementary result. And it gives us um, two, uh, two consequences that will be important. The first one is, well, we just analyzed the sequence. So cup product with A is 0, if and only if B comes from, is a norm from FA. So uh, for every B in F, um, AB is equal to zero, if and only if B is a norm. So there exists an alpha in FA, which is the, such that B is the norm of this alpha. And the second property is we obtain it by, by looking here. If you have some Brouwer class, to torsion Brouwer class, then the norm, the co-restriction of this Brouwer class is zero, if and only if um, it, it's in the image of restriction. So A comes from uh, comes from Brouwer F two. Okay, so we will use these facts repeatedly. Uh, you see that the importance of the norm it gives us in some sense it gives us equations for these two for these two properties. The, this property, A B zero, and also the property that the norm is zero. Okay. Okay, now using this I wanna uh, I wanna prove this uh, the second key lemma here. Uh, the first one is this symmetric uh, identity and the second one is the trace lemma. which is an elementary statement about the Brouwer group of, um, I guess, a B-quadratic extension. So, uh, uh, yeah. Um, well, you see. So I take two scalars in F, and then I take rho a scalar from FA, and mu a scalar from FB. And we, I suppose, so such that, their norms are equal. Okay, the norms are equal. Uh, 
And then, okay, it's called the trace lemma, so there's a trace somewhere. Here's the trace. G is the trace of rho plus the trace of mu. Okay? And we have, so this is an element of f. Uh, and we suppose, so we assume that the g is actually non zero. Okay, assume g is non zero. Then, then what do we get? We get this identity in the Brouwer group of FB. The Brouwer class mu A is equal to the Brouwer class of GA. Okay, so what is the point of this, of this uh, lemma? Well, you see, this is, a, this is a, a, an honest class in Brouwer FB, right? The first element is in FB star, and the second element is in F star, okay? On the other hand, this, this actually comes from f, because g is from f. So this is from f star, and so is this. So it, it gives, this lemma gives you some condition for which a Brouwer class defined over fp descends to a Brouwer class defined over f, but also in a very precise, precise way. You don't, you're not changing a, okay? So we will, uh, we will see how to use this in the proof of proposition one. So, okay, let, let me just give the proof of this. It's a, a simple calculation. So, um, let's say that the group of, the Galois group of FAB, thought of as a Galois Zimo two square algebra, is a sigma A, sigma B, where sigma A switches square root of A and fixes square root of B and conversely for sigma B. Then the key idea is to compute the norm of rho plus mu. Rho plus mu. So the norm for A. Okay, so this is this means I, I do rho plus mu. Well, I write down what it means. It means by definition that I do rho plus mu and then sigma A of rho plus sigma A of mu. Exactly, but, but this, so you take this as a definition. This is sigma A of rho plus sigma A of mu, right? Sigma A is an element of the Brouwer group of this extension, and I take this. So it's the norm from, I guess it's the norm from FAB to, to FB. Well, yeah, they take this as a definition. Now the key point is that um, is that mu, as you noticed, is in, uh, is in FB. So it has nothing to do with sigma A. So this is sigma A rho plus mu. Right? Sigma A acts as the identity on FB. Okay, so now let's just expand this. Uh, this is mu. Okay, there's a specific order uh, that I want to do. Yeah. Rho sigma A of rho plus uh, mu sigma A of rho plus rho sigma A of mu plus mu squared. Okay, and now we use the assumption that the norms are the same. This, this norm is the same. This is the, the A norm of rho. It's the same as the B norm of mu. So this is mu, sigma B of mu. And then, well, the same story. So sigma A of rho plus rho. So nothing changes for the last three terms. Mu squared. Okay, sorry, here, uh, here sigma A of mu is actually mu, right? I mean, it's fine to write sigma of mu, but we, we, we discuss the fact that sigma of mu is mu. Okay, now you see that there is a factor of mu everywhere, right? So I can just factor this uh, mu, and the rest is exactly sigma of rho plus rho, so trace of rho, and then sigma b of mu plus mu, trace of mu, so this is just g, okay? So the norm of rho plus mu is equal to mu g. Okay, so here, let me, since there was a question, let me emphasize sigma a of mu is equal to mu. So this has been, has been used in the proof. Right, like maybe, it's, maybe it is simpler. Uh, I know, you, okay, so you, you see FAB is not, a, if b is equal to a, FAB is not FA. It's FA times FA, it's a Galois algebra. 
So oh, even when it's, it's, it's always of degree 4 over f. And, and sigma a still acts trivially on sigma b. Yeah, yeah, no. We're doing everything with Galo algebra so that we don't have to discuss all these edge cases. OK. So now, um, so what do we get? We get the mu g a is equal to the norm. Well, mu g is equal to the norm of that. So norm, uh, norm of a of rho plus mu a. But now by, uh, I guess, 2. No, yeah. By, no, by 1, sorry. By property 1 there. Right, I have a and a norm from a, so uh, this is this is zero in um, in the bar group of F B. Right, so this is a norm a here means really norm from F A B to F B. Right. Okay, so now this means that mu g a is equal to zero. Then by linearity, mu a is equal to g a. So that's the proof of this uh, trace lemma which is useful independently of uh, massive vanishing. OK, now let's see what I want to keep. Maybe I will go to, maybe I will state, I will state it there, actually. Uh, yeah, OK, I'm going to have to erase this. But the, we do need to remember these properties. But I will, I will remind you when they appear. And here I want to write the proposition. Proposition one. Okay. I will write it in a slightly different forms. Remember, um, Alexander wrote it using the fact that certain k products are zero. I will write it using the fact that certain elements are norms, and this is equivalent by this uh, property one. OK, which that you have in your notes. Um, OK, so here is the proposition one. Um, so take A, C, D in um, F star, and take uh, delta in F, D star, such that the norm of delta is equal to C. OK, and then. Um, I forgot to write alpha, sorry. Here, alpha in F A star. OK, so now suppose uh, we suppose that alpha delta, which is a, a Brouwer class in F A D, actually comes from F. OK, that, that was our assumption. This comes from the fact that the massive product is defined. And then we also suppose that C is not a square. Technical assumption. Uh, then, so end. So then, um, there exists x, which is a norm from fc, a norm from c, and nu in FA, uh, such that two proper, the following two properties are satisfied. Property one, uh, alpha x nu is equal to alpha x delta uh, over FAD. And two, the norm of alpha x nu Right, alpha x nu now lives in Brouwer group of F a. I think of it as, so maybe I, I will just write F a over F just to, for clarity. So the, the norm from F a to F should be 0. And this is, of course, an equation over F, the Brouwer group of F. OK, so the way Alexander stated this, there were, there were three conditions, 1, 2, 3. And condition 1 was actually x c is equal to 0. But as we know, as we now know, this is the same as saying x is a norm from F c. OK? So I, just, I will just focus on the, these two conditions. These are the, of course, this condition is relatively easy, is easy to impose, but these two will be harder. So we focus on these two. OK, let me, let me just remind you why we need this uh, for a second. So we have, we have uh, the following 
uh, situation. We have the bar group of F, the bar group of FA, to torsion, and the bar group of FAD. And we start from some alpha delta here. And we know that this alpha delta comes from some class in the bar group of, uh, some class over F, right? That, that is our assumption. Uh, what, we, what this proposition accomplishes is to find some x so that if I modify alpha delta and I make it alpha x delta, not only alpha x delta still comes from bar of f, but actually comes from some class here, some alpha x nu, which itself comes from f. Okay, so the first line is where we start from, and the second line is where we want to get. We, we have a class that we know comes from f, and we want to do this intermediate step. We want to write it as this, as a class alpha x nu, which also comes from f. Why do I say it comes from f? Because the co-restriction is zero, and, and we said the co-restriction zero means coming from f, okay? So this is, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And then, if you remember, proposition two, once we're in this situation, proposition two tells you that you can put some y here to make the class zero, right? Alpha x nu y will become zero, and then also alpha x delta y becomes zero, okay? So once we're here, we're reduced to proposition two, which has been proved yesterday. Okay, so now all it remains to do is to prove, um, to prove this proposition. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna erase the trace lemma, I'm sorry. Okay, but remember that the, what is the, what, what do we have to rem um, remember of the trace lemma? We have equal norms and some, some trace, and then the trace allows us to go to go down in the quadratic extension. That's, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so now let's, let's prove proposition uh, one. So proposition one, proof. So what is the, the idea of the proof? We have, the idea of the proof is the following. To use the trace lemma plus the symmetric identity, we will use them in some way, you will see how, to find a generic solution to property one, okay? So, if on a generic, we, so this will not be a solution over f, it will be a solution over some field bigger than f, some function field over f. Basically, we parameterize all the possible solutions to one, and then we need to impose two. So, uh, so, we, so the second part will be a specialization from k to f to some f point, so if you specialize, an identity remains an identity, so one remains true, and then, but then you will also be able to achieve two. To also achieve two at the same time. So the specialization will not be some random specialization, it will be a specialization to a careful, carefully chosen point. Okay, so let's begin. So um, now this is the, this is the idea, the, the, the implementation of the idea requires that I define a bunch of polynomials, so uh, bear with me. Uh, there will be some, some notation here, so. Okay, so what is, let's start from this. What is alpha C? This is a Brouwer class over FA. Well, alpha C is just the norm from FAD to FA of, of alpha delta. Okay, when, whenever you have uh, some Brouwer class and you do, you do a norm, but one of the two entries already is in the field that you're going to with the norm, then you, can, you just need to take the norm of the other term. So here, the norm of this is just alpha norm of delta, but norm of delta is C. Okay, so I think there was even an exercise about this. Or maybe there will be today. Um, um, so this is zero because alpha delta comes from F, so the co-restriction is zero. So here we use the assumption, alpha delta from f. So this alpha c is zero. This means that alpha is, um, is a norm from fc. So alpha is alpha one squared minus c alpha two squared, where this alpha one and alpha two are in f, right, some in fa. Uh, in FA. Um, so 
this is an A. Um, and okay, so this is, this is what we have. In fact, if, if alpha one and alpha two are linearly dependent, this is not, uh, the, the proof becomes very easy. So I'm just gonna skip that case and I will assume that these two alpha one, alpha two are linearly independent over f. Right, fa is a vector space of dimension two over f and these two, I can assume that these two elements form a basis of that vector space. Okay, so this is a, um, yeah. This is an assumption, but there, uh, behind this there is a, a tiny calculation to solve the, the easy case. Okay, so now what, what about delta? Delta is u1 plus square root of d, u2, right? It's an element of fd. So that's how you write elements of fd. And the norm is equal to c. So u1 squared minus c u2 squared is equal to d, or if you prefer d, um, d u2 squared. Um, sorry, what did I write? Here is a d, and this is c. Sorry, u1 squared minus d u2 squared is equal to c, or I want to rewrite this as d uh, u2 squared is equal to u1 squared minus c, okay? Which closely resembles this. Okay, and now I'm, gonna, I'm going to give, uh, define further polynomials. So we, we take the, this, this k that we want, so k will be the function field of A2. So that means it's f of x1, x2, where x1 and x2 are two variables, okay? Linearly, algebraically independent variables. Okay, so now we define these polynomials. And uh, you may notice that these polynomials resemble those appearing on that board. And the reason is that eventually we will go from, from L to to K, I guess, uh, from, by specialization. And, and we will recover these polynomials. Okay, so F will be X1 squared minus CX2 squared. That's an element of K, no zero. Uh, then I define H1 to be alpha 1 X1 plus C alpha 2 X2. I define H2 to be uh, somehow mixed now, so x, alpha 1 x2 plus alpha 2 x1, and this is now, I guess they're both in Ka, sorry. You need, you need the, the square root of A. Um, and then H will be um, H1 plus U1 H2. Okay, maybe the precise form of these polynomials is not too important, just notice that they are linear in x1, x2, that's important. Um, and then G will be 2H, H2, okay? And this is also in Ka. Okay, they're all non-zero. There's a tiny computation to show that, but I'll skip it. Okay, so now we use the trace lemma. Uh, okay, so it's a little tricky how to find the right element, so I'm just gonna write it down. So if you consider delta, and you take the, the trace from AD to, to A, and you add up the trace uh, from KA alpha F to KA of this guy, uh, H1 over H2 plus the square root of alpha F over uh, H2. Okay, I will call this uh, fraction uh, row. Okay, so what is this? Okay, I'll spare you the, well, I guess it's not too hard, right? The trace of delta is 2u1. The trace of this is 2h1 over h2. So this is exactly why I define h to be like that. This is just 2h over h2. So it's g. You can check that it's g up to squares. It's g up to squares, okay? And it's an element in Ka star. Uh, right, is G up to what, what square? I mean, H2 squared, right? Um, okay, so also we have the norms. So, okay, the first assumption of the trace lemma is satisfied. We have some non-zero trace, okay? And the second assumption was the norm. The norm of um, delta is equal to C, by definition, 
of that by assumption on delta and the norm and this other norm of rho um, so k a alpha f to k a of rho um, yeah it, it's also c this norm this norm is also c um, you can check it so so then the trace lemma this trace lemma tells us that um, alpha f delta is equal to alpha f g. And this is over k a. OK, so this is the first. So this may not look like it, but it is 1. Oh, yeah, thanks. k a d. So this does, uh, not, may not look like it, but it is, it is 1. It's just over a bigger field, right? Imagine that you specialize your f to some x and your g to some nu, then you get exactly 1, OK? But the point is, we cannot just specialize randomly. We need to impose 2 as well. OK, so now here's where the symmetric identity comes in. Um, so now we think about 2, and we specialize. Now, let me see how much time I have left. So we specialize from L the field of, or the symmetric identity, and we go to Ka. OK, so I need to tell you where, where does each variable go. Uh, C, x1, x2, y1, y2, and u. These are the six variables. OK, and now the na you see why the names have been chosen like this. It's because they kind of hint at the specialization. So C will go to C. But now C is a scalar from F, right? C, C here is a variable. Now C is, is an element of F. X1 will go to X1. And X2 will also go to X2, right? K is, is uh, generated by X1, X2. Uh, Y1 now will, will go to alpha 1. And y2 will go to alpha 2. So I specialize two elements of fa. And then I send u to u1. U, um, u1, which is an element of f. So you see these elements now generate ka. k comes from here, a comes from here. The square root of a comes from here. Um, OK, now you, you can check with simple calculations where, where the, the original polynomials go. So I will just. Stated so v goes to h, w goes to h2, so 2vw goes to 2h h2, which is g, and then x1 squared minus cx2 squared goes to itself, but as an element of k, so f, and y1 squared minus cy2 squared goes to alpha because, because of this. Uh, of this. Alpha is equal to alpha 1 square minus c alpha 2 square. And then d, as I already um, maybe noticed at some point, d goes to, well, to u1 square minus c. But what is u1 square minus c? It's exactly, it's exactly uh, d u square, u2 squared. So it doesn't exactly go to d, but almost d up to a square. OK, so that's the specialization. And now we just have to plug in. Um, we just need to plug in the, um, these, these new values into this identity. So, OK, so what do we get? So the symmetric identity. Gives, so specializes, 2. OK, so uh, x1 squared minus cx2 squared is f. Then uh, the y1 squared minus cy2 squared is alpha. And then we get a g, but right? Uh, I'm using those equations now. OK. And then it's equal to, to what? To f again. And then 2x2 um, x1 plus u1 x2. This doesn't, didn't give a name to this just to, um, I think there aren't enough names. So uh, then there is the, 
the other the, the other way around. So now it's the y's turn. So um, alpha, and then two x two becomes alpha. Uh, sorry, two y two becomes alpha two, and then alpha one plus u one alpha two, and then the mixed term. That's okay. That's d u one squared, but up to this. Um, the symbol doesn't see squares, so I can just write d. And then x1 plus u1 x2 alpha 1 plus u1 alpha 2 h. And this is over ka. OK, so I just plugged in. Nothing, uh, I've, I've done nothing else. Uh, yeah. OK, now, um, so now we use the trace lemma again. Um, this, um, so here, I, I won't do it explicitly but because it's, it's just like we did, uh, the thing we did before, but this is actually, um, this is exactly alpha delta. Yeah, this is alpha delta. So, so this, basically, if you, you run the trace lemma again with some suitable element, then this will become your trace, okay? And, Right, over, over uh, oh, this is also over, right, exactly. So this is over Ka, but if I do over Kad, now this becomes, uh, right, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so maybe I, maybe I do want to keep this uh, over Ka then. So I will just write here, so over Kad. Um, over K A D, what uh, this alpha two alpha two alpha one plus u one alpha two is equal to alpha delta. Okay. Okay. So now, now okay. Now what I want to do is I, I take the norm of this. I take the norm of this identity, so, so now I, I la I'm going to land in k. So I get alpha f g. This is, uh, so what is going to happen is uh, the, f the first two terms are 0. So this, this is defined over f, so it's 0. Right, this is already over, defined over f. So in, in the second term, it turns out it's also 0. This, uh, if you do the norm of this, although maybe it's not super clear from the way I wrote it. Uh, but in any case, what remains is, this, is the second term. So the second term is, um, so I need to take the core restriction of this. The first element is a scalar, is, a, is from k. So I just need to take the norm of, of the second term. Um, so I get, I get d, and then norm of this, this product. OK, now the first term of the product is, is in k. So it's a, the norm will be just a square. So I can forget about it. And the second, the second and third I'm going to keep. So norm k a over k. Um, OK, not enough space. Alpha 1 plus u 1 alpha 2 times h. Okay, and I'm just going to call eta this, this guy. Um, this, uh, the, the thing in parentheses, alpha 1 plus u1 alpha 2. Okay, so just let me just write this down. Mm. Let's see, what do I want to keep? Uh, first of all, let's see how much time I have because this may be a good place. No, 10 more minutes. Okay, yeah, we can finish it. So, yeah, okay, you, uh, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erase the, this. I'm going to erase this uh, and, and rewrite the, this equation that we get. So norm k a over k um, alpha f g 
is equal to d times the norm uh, of uh, h rho, uh, sorry, h eta in uh, in bar group of, and now this is in the bar group of k. Okay. So remember, this is the left hand side is like two. Suppose we specialize at some point. The left hand side will be the norm of alpha times a scalar times some, some, some alpha x times nu, or some x and nu. But the, left, the right hand side doesn't need to be zero, right? So, um, so the point is we need to specialize so that the right hand side becomes zero. So specialize, uh, so must specialize at p, so let's write p as p1, p2, Okay, so some point of, of, of the of the affine plane such that such that the right hand side is zero. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. In fact, we will do a little bit more. We will find so we'll find p such that. Uh, right, um, such that h of p is equal to eta. Um, so, okay, such that h, the, the rational function h, uh, which was this linear function written uh, more or less here, is defined is defined at p non-zero. Well, and equal to to eta. See, okay, and and equal to eta. Okay, in particular, it's non zero. Um, so, okay, let's see, let's see if we can do it. So, HP, when is HP equals to eta? Okay, now I do regret having erased H, so we'll just rewrite it here. Um, so, remember, H is, is H1 plus U, H2, and then H1, H2 were linear. Okay? Um, these linear functions. So, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna write write down their definition here to tell you what it means that h of p is eta. So if and only if u1 alpha 1 p2 alpha 2 p1 plus alpha 1 p1 plus c alpha 2 p2 is equal to eta. So this is a h of p, h1 of p and h2 of p basically. Okay? So we need to solve a system of linear equations system of two equations in two unknowns. The equations are P1, the unknowns are P1 and P2. Let me rewrite it as alpha 1 plus U1 alpha 2, P1 plus, sorry, U1 alpha 1 plus C alpha 2, P2. This should be eta, so this is some linear, linear equation, system of two linear equations. So if you remember alpha 1 and alpha 2, I said that are linearly independent. We, we can suppose they're linearly independent. So to solve some, an equation like this, it's enough to check that the determinant of the matrix is non-zero. So what is the, ma the relevant matrix? It's 1, U1, U1, C, right, the coefficients from the system. And this is exactly C minus U1 squared, okay? And this is non-zero because C is not a square. So this is, the, this is why we need the technical assumption that C is not a square at the beginning. Okay, so conclusion, P exists, and in fact, is, and with this condition, HP of eta is actually even unique. Okay, so in particular, such P exists, so if I, if I specialize at P, so specialize at P, I will get alpha x nu, so G will specialize to X and, no, sorry, F will specialize to X and G will specialize to nu. I get alpha X nu equals D, and then there's a square, so, so zero. Okay, so that, that is two. Okay, so that finishes the proof. I think maybe I have a few minutes left, but yeah, okay, I'm still gonna finish here, thank you.
Thank you. Uh, so any questions?